Hey everybody, today's r and r and show is brought to you by Upper Story, publishers of Spintronics, a game that you can build mechanical circuits with. And hello, Chris. How's it going, my friend? Oh, it's, it's going pretty great, Ruel. How are you? I'm How hanging you in there. We, You know, during the pre-show, folks, you can watch the uh -huh. pre-show uh, here on YouTube. We do an extended version of this live on Twitch. During the pre-show, we're talking about this how... a good one. Yeah, we're talking about how busy we are. I mean, it's been insanely busy for both of us. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing stuff for uh, board game companies. You've been acting and uh, opening shows. Mm -hmm. And so I want to thank you for taking the time out and joining us here today to talk about board games no i want to thank you for picking such a great uh topic of conversation of travel games which i am well acquainted with being away from my house right now yeah that's yeah. what i want to thank you about it's gonna be it's gonna be a great show uh, but first i want to talk about spintronics chris uh this is from our friends at upper story they're sponsoring this episode of the r and r show mm -hmm. and this we we had also talked about during the pre-show we both saw this on kickstarter when it launched yeah. um you know, and we're both excited about it. And I'm thrilled that I've been, I've had my copy for a little while now. I've played through a bunch of this. I'm not going to spoil it because I'm just going to show you the basics, folks. But this whole yeah. book, this is a puzzle book, Chris. There are, oh man, oh, I don't want to give the answers away. But there's like, <laughs> you know, it, we will remember, right? Yeah. Like I always find in these sorts of things where it's like, oh, careful, no spoilers. Yeah. Yeah. Because that small one page second that you saw of Sorry. things put together is going to stay in your head long enough for when you go get the game and build it yourself. No, get yeah. out of here. It's like that darn not well, with I saw it. Yeah. Uh, so there's <laughs> these like, puzzles are cool. Yeah. They're like 60 puzzles in here. I've done, yeah. I think, half of them already. And awesome. um, what, yeah, what, what's really cool? So I'm going to open up the box and, oh man, you know, the, the quality of this, Chris, you know, we did talk mm -hmm. about this before in the pre-show. The quality is really solid. These are all really solid plastic and little gears awesome. and everything. And what you're doing is these are mechanical circuits, um, but they're done in a way without electricity. And you, it's a very, you know, I was always, I'm always like sort of hesitant about like educational games, right? So-called educational games. Yeah. But this is awesome. Like you were, there's something about it. It's, it's analog, but it's talking about the digital world. And yet, I mean, it's so neat. Like you're, they have magnets. So these just pop onto here. And as you can see, I can shake it around and they're not coming off, right? They're awesome. solid magnets. Yeah. And then Great. these pieces here, as you you know go through this book, it's it's really neat, Chris. It's got this story. You're actually going through a little storybook. Oh, cool. The yeah. graphic novel element to it. That's amazing. Yeah. Which I don't I also don't remember in the Kickstarter if they talked about this part of it. I I definitely didn't remember that. I've yeah. got the Kickstarter page pulled up on on my screen over here, but uh, mm -hmm. just just to get a closer view as well and, and looking at it again and yeah. uh yeah yeah well, that's that's awesome isn't that, that neat that's so too. during the narrative it's teaching you how to do the you know it has a tutorial talking about the battery here and then all the little circuits you're going to make so here's a basic circuit you've got resistors and what it does is they show you they give you the starting thing and they're going to give you little challenges these are the puzzles like how to make your first circuit right and cool. what they do is you have it on your table and you're going to put it together. So let me, I've already put this one together. This is like, I think, puzzle five or something. But yeah. the parts, as you can see, they come over here in the box. There's a bunch of them here. Little circuits. You have little uh, chains that you're going to chain up here. And what you do is you take one of these and you're just going to slot it in there. It's got a little connector piece. And you, that just goes right there. And you have your little key. It's like the magic key. Just mm. turn this around. Oops, I have it upside down. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got to put it right side up, folks. And then you go, you just turn the key. And it locks into place. There it is. Boom. Wow. Just like that. Cool. And then depending on what you have, you're going to put the little resistors, the little circuits, and they just magnetize there. And I've already built this um, this chain here. So now this isn't actually part of the puzzle, but I'm just going to show you how it works. What you do is just grab this, and you're going to pull the little thing, and there it is. It's spinning. It's spintronics. It's, it's like magic. And... Some so that's going clockwise. Some of the puzzles are how can you make a resistor go counterclockwise, and then how can you do two little resistors counterclockwise? And here's the challenge five, which I was talking about. Here's the setup, and then you have the cool. different uh, things here. So let me see. I will set this up. So I take this off, and I've already pre-made my chain. So let me see. I have a little 
you just add that little... comes like separate in the in the box. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I can uh, just increase the length of the chain by adding more links. There's a ton of links in in the box, and I already pre-made this because it does uh, first setup. It takes a little while, but once you get into it, oh man, it's so easy. Uh, so this is plastic, a nice uh, quality plastic here. Um, whoops. And what I'm going to do is link these chain or chain the links together. Boom, boom, boom. Ta-da. And then for this puzzle here, they give you the starting setup. So you want the setup to look like this. So I just take my handy dandy key. I take this off counterclockwise. That is gone. And then they give you a 1,000 and a 500 ohm resistor. So I've got 500 and 1,000. And the, tr the puzzle is how am I going to make these spin counterclockwise? So what I want to do is chain these together. Okay. So I'm I'm totally giving away one of the answers to the puzzle. That's okay, folks. I think that's okay. Yeah, there's because... like sixty of them. Yeah, right. Yeah. Did you get now? Did you did you get Act One or Act Two or the full? Uh, I got Act uh, One. This is Act One. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Act. Yeah. Yeah. Because there was there was two on the I remember from Kickstarter and I well I I was refreshing myself when I I yes. knew Spintronics would be talking about it. But they have they had two options, right? You can have Act One and then mm -hmm. Act Two. Which gives you like a little bit more complexity. Yep. Um, Act one was the sort of the base that a lot of people did, but even sixty puzzles in one thing with like high quality components, and especially seeing the components now, I remember thinking the the, the one cool thing while you while you continue, well, and you can cut me off whenever if you want. No, no, go ahead. To, but like what I really what really drew me into this campaign way back when uh, was this this was I would just looked it up too was June twenty twenty one June nineteenth twenty twenty one is when it funded. And what I thought was really cool was like this little blurb that they said being like electronics is the foundations of modern technology, but it's, it's, it's especially difficult to understand, right? Because you need mathematics. And so the whole concept of all of these puzzles is to help you understand like basic mathematics, right? Yes. Like, oh, sorry, ba basic electronics um, and, and how circuits work and how these things connect. And, and that was the educational part that you're talking about, mm -hmm. but being able to frame it in a way that's so tactile Yes. And like with clearly good quality components, like even just you snapping and moving things around in place, you're like, yeah, there's these magnets and these chains. I'm like, and it spins. I'm like, of course it does. Is that neat? That, that's exciting, right? Yeah. So to have this like physical puzzle thing, I think is is potentially really cool. Yeah. And I think, you know, along those lines, we're all analog gamers here, folks. We talk about board games. We talk about analog games. And there's something, like yeah. you said, something about that tactile feeling. So about seeing this and you know, putting it together. And here's how I'm solving this puzzle here, this challenge five. How do I make these go counterclockwise? Look, instead of placing this on uh, on the uh, little uh, um, battery here, I put the, you actually see, I put the chain right outside of it. So when I pull the thing, they're actually going counterclockwise now cool. because of the way I put the chain there right. rather than yeah, around I mean, it where I mean, it would go around and around. And there it is. Now, this isn't all you get, folks. There's a bunch of stuff in here. Again, I don't want to spoil any, uh, too much of it, but there's other pieces. Chris, there's something here that actually makes sound. It's really cool. Uh, yeah. It's just amazing. So I want to thank um, uh, Upper Story for uh, sponsoring the r, r show today. There you go, folks. Be sure to check the links below uh, for more info on um, Spintronics and uh, where you can uh, get that. But Let's get on with honestly, the show. Oh yeah, yeah, go yeah ahead. just just one quick quick point before we before we go on. Like honestly, even if you're not like, even if you're like, oh, it's probably, it might be too expensive for me with all the little hardware. Like just, I still think you should just check it out for fun. Like, oh I, yeah, I think it looks really cool. And so even if you're like, oh maybe I buy it, maybe I not. Like legitimately, just go check it out and and for 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 the sole purpose of going, yeah, that's neat. Oh, oh yeah, that is really cool. And seeing the little bits and seeing yeah. them, like them walk walk it through, totally. Like, I, I remember this from two years ago and thinking about how neat it was. And I'm so thrilled that it seems to be delivering on the promise that it made yes. on the Kickstarter as well. Yeah. So that's Same just, here. It's very exciting for me. Uh, oh. And I was like, I was like being able to, you know, le legitimately talk about things that I'm excited about. And this is one of them. So, this yeah. is one of them. That's right. Thank you for that, uh, Chris. And yeah. why don't we jump into the show? Uh, this is our top 15 travel games. We talked about we are on the road. It's that time of the year. Summertime people are traveling, and we've got 15 great games. Uh, Chris, myself, and Richard, um, we will be mm -hmm. talking about 15 travel games. Um, I'm gonna give it up to Chris. Uh, you're gonna kick us off today, my friend. What you got on the list for us? 
Yeah. So number fifteen is oh, I think oh no, it's in my it's in my other bag. It's not Uh-oh. it's not within reach. Okay. But it is one that I brought because uh, I am traveling right now. I'm not. I'm normally in Toronto. I'm in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and so this is one that I was was like an auto include. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very simple game. You can play this at a lot of different places. This is why it makes it on the list. Uh, it's Skull. Nice. At least I think it's Skull. I it is I Skull. That as yes. right. No, yeah, okay. As long as I put it in the right order and I'm not talking tales out of school, which I generally <laughs> also do. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, Skull is is so good. Uh, I got this. I found this in, in a bin at this place called Binge Bins, and it was open and it was scattered everywhere, and I collected all the pieces, and I said, give this to me, and they, they sold it to me for eight bucks, and it was great. Nice. Uh, but 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 I brought this one especially because it's really good for outdoors too all it is is four coasters and like a little mat so everybody gets four coasters three have flowers one has a skull and then it starts by everybody putting a coaster face down in front of them and then on your turn you can do two things you could put another coaster on top of your coaster or you can start the bidding and so the bidding round themselves the bidding is you say a number and that's how many coasters you think you can flip over starting with your own that don't have skulls on them. And so the premise is like, okay, well, I'm bidding two because I know I have two in front of me that don't have skulls, but maybe I'm just bidding that because I have a skull and I want people to flip over my skull. Because if you don't flip over flowers and you flip over a skull, well, you lose a coaster. If you do flip over only flowers, you get a point. First to two points wins. Like it's a quick game, Mm -hmm. super easy to play, really good like bluffing and uh, a social game of just reading each other. It's, it's, Perudo, I think, basically, mm. uh, other than but just using like coasters and skulls and roses. It used to be called skulls and roses. I remember back in the day yep. when I was first getting into board gaming, I went into a board game shop and I said, Hey, I'm doing a secret Santa and I want a game that's going to be a hit. And they said, Oh, yeah, take this one. And I, hopefully it was a hit. But now that I know it, what game it was, I feel very good about that secret Santa purchase from way back. Um, yeah, really solid. And, and for travel considerations, you can play this anywhere. It plays up to six people. Uh, and the, especially that you can play it outside because it's yes. just cardboard or like in a bar, wherever. It's just a really good game to play on the go. Very simple to teach. Very simple to get people into. That's our collective number 15 skull. Yeah, great. Uh, great call. I had a feeling you put this one on the list. I know we've talked about skull before. <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah, I yeah. think it's a great point that you bring up, uh, Chris, as far as it being able to be played outside, right? I mean, if mm-hmm. we're truly traveling, you know, we do want some games that are able to withstand the elements, and Skull is one of them. It's a fantastic yeah. game. And you know what? That was a pretty major consideration for me for, yeah. for for my own travel because I'm doing outdoor theater right now. So in between shows or rehearsal or whatever, I, I, I was really cognizant of, of trying to bring games that would translate well to be, to outside. Yeah. So, yeah, I was I was just going to ask you, you know, now that you're uh, on, you know, travel right now, did you bring your copy of Skull with you to uh, Nova Scotia? Oh yeah. Oh nice. yeah, it was it was the first one in my bag. Nice. One. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. great choice. Uh let's move on to number 14. This is uh from for me. Uh this mm-hmm. is a game that I believe also can be played outside, uh Chris. This is collectively our number 14. It is Deep Sea Adventure. Um this is a push your luck game. Uh here Oops, uh, here we are, Michelle and I playing it on my channel a couple of years ago. Uh, this is an oink game, so oink games are very tiny. They can literally fit in mm. your pocket. And it's a push-your-luck game. It's a cooperative. It's interesting. It's, oh, uh, here I am with a bear puppet. Um, that's what we do on oh my, my channel. Oh, my goodness, so, Ruel. Yeah. A bear? A bear. You it's, would do that to me? Benny the Bitsbear. Did you know bear. that bears kidnapped my entire family? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't Chris. believe you would, sh- you would show totally me triggered. this drama. <laughs> you wonder why I no longer play games outside. This is because, because all the bears the bear. have forced oh me gosh. inside. Uh, friends who are afraid of bears, my apologies. Um, this is a deep sea adventure. It's a push your luck game. It's semi cooperative. So you are traveling down uh, in the deep sea trying to get treasures, and you're rolling a die. And there are six sided dice, but they don't go up to six. And what you do is roll and you go down, and at any point you can stop and pick up a treasure, but you're gonna. The decision point here is when do I go back up to the submarine? Because Chris, as you go down further, as the more treasures you get, you have oxygen to worry about, and you're running out of oxygen the second you jump in the ocean. And every time you go roll, uh, move down, the more treasures you have, that counts against your oxygen. So you're trying to race back up while you still have oxygen. If 
oxygen runs out, everyone, not just you, but everyone that's down there loses. Mm. You just lose all your treasures. You get zero for the round. So it's this really neat element. It was like, how far can I push? But then there's a little bit, a tiny bit of take that. Like I can just go down, not too deep. I can go shallow, pick a bunch of treasures and go right back up and just hose everyone because I'm right back up. Aha, uh-huh, I have air. And just look at the watch everyone else trying to roll dice, trying to panic and get back to the top before they run out of air. So uh, it only goes three rounds. It's a 20 minute game. It's such a great push your luck game. It's super easy to get to the table. As you can see, it's tiny. It's an oik game, so it's mm-hmm. very easy to travel with. And that's why it's our number fourteen deep sea adventure. That's a that's a nice pick. Yeah, really really interesting. I I when I was making my list, I obviously looked up on YouTube for other people who've made similar travel lists, and mm-hmm. I think I saw this on one of them. And I was oh, like, okay. okay, that's interesting. Um, Maybe maybe Brothers Murph might have put it on theirs. I think yeah. I think Brothers I think Murph did. might have might have done a list too. But like yeah, it's it, oink games make sense, right? You they're a perfect fit for this. They they are designed to be travelable. You know, definitely. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's move on. Number oops, uh, that's Spintronics. Uh, let's move on to our number thirteen <laughs> game. Uh, Rich is gonna be talking about it right now. Okay, folks, before we get to my number 13, I just wanted to say, this is not the first time I have done this particular list. Uh, About half a decade ago, just when my wife Jen and I were leaving Malta to move back to the States, I uh, teamed up with Eleni from Czech Games Edition. And we did a top 10 travel games. Jen and I were about to travel to the States. She was about to travel back home to Greece. We were both living in Malta at the time. And... uh, I think it's a great list. I think it still stands. There's a link for it down in the show notes if after you're done with this video, you want to hear about a bunch more really great travel games. I highly recommend it. Had a great time with Elaney. And uh, now, moving on. Chris, I'm really glad to see Skull is on this list because I can't wait to hear you describe it. Because, interestingly, Skull made Elaney's list half a decade ago. So, are you just copying her? I don't know. But I have to admit, when she was describing it to me, I could not get my head around it. I've actually uh, seen Shut Up and Sit Down do a video about this game. I could not get my head around it. Hopefully, Chris, you will finally set me straight on why Skull is so fantastic. And, well, uh, Deep Sea Adventure looks really charming. A fun little push-your-luck game. I would certainly want to give that one a try at some point. But anyway, folks, now let's move on to number 13 on this list. And I'm just going to have to apologize right up front because it's Onironauts. And I'm apologizing because this is a game that you cannot get at a very, very small print run. It is readily available in Ukraine from the publisher iGames. I don't know, maybe you could order direct from them and uh, that would certainly be cool. But here's the deal. I have always felt that whenever we're traveling and I'm carrying games with us, I've always got to have something in the backpack that I can use for playing with the normal folks. You know, if you're part of a travel group or something like that. My wife and I, for years, traveled with her parents. And so, I, while I always carried, you know, nice crunchy games for me and Jen to enjoy as hardcore gamer geeks, you got to have something to play with the, uh, with the, with the, uh, with the normies. And for me, that used to be Dixit or Code Names, but Oneironaut so uh, eclipses those. It's something you can instantly teach to anybody uh, because it's cooperative Dixit. It's absolutely fantastic, and I hope it gets a wider release. I guess I'm just going to keep talking about it until some publisher works with iGames to get it more widely available um, because it's absolutely fantastic. Um I don't really need to say much more than Cooperative Dixit, although there's an extra added bonus. It works great for two players also, which is kind of unheard of for these kinds of games. So I highly recommend it. Now, if you can't get your hands on it as a fallback, you could get a copy of Stella Dixit Universe because even though it comes with Dixit games instead of Onironaut games, it comes with enough components that you could replicate the functionality of Onironauts. So in a pinch, you could go with that, but... Oh my gosh, this game is so much fun. Works great for two, works great for higher player counts. I've played it at a bunch of different player counts at social events. It's always a hit. And working with other people as opposed to trying to beat them, I think, is just a more inviting thing in general. So number 13 on the list, once again on the r and I think this is the third time it's uh, made a countdown on Ironauts. Okay. Yeah. Oneironauts, and I keep wanting to call it one Ironauts. That's just I see. That's why I want to pronounce it. But I know Rich was talking about it several times. Have you gotten a, a chance to play it yet, uh, uh, Chris? No, I, I haven't. I, haven't either. No, I, yeah. I, I only know of it through uh, Richard talking about it on past lists for sure. But, yeah. 
Dick, Dixit's great. I mean, like, I love Dixit. Dixit. Is, still works that's why mysterium works yep um and so if you like those sorts of games absolutely one to check out definitely cool okay so that's our number 13 let's move on to number 12 back to chris all right number 12 this is a game i i i really hold dear to my heart and this is a game that i took on tour with me when we were doing a 100 schools like tour of, of a show called beethoven lives upstairs and we played it every single lunchtime i'm not even joking with you like nice. every single lunch we played multiple times of this game it's so quick it's another card based game it's another sort of bluffing game and this one gets up a little bit over skull because it has a little bit more depth and complexity to it and that's coup yes. so coup for me is is so good like i could play this so frequently and specifically coup not coup g54 i think coup g54 it comes in a larger box it adds a little bit too much complexity with coup the base coup is so elegant in terms of how it uses the five roles and the game just gets deeper and deeper when you play with the same people because you know that at the beginning of the round i'm gonna have two dukes in my hand i'm just gonna have them it doesn't matter what you all say i'm gonna have two dukes in my hand uh, and so, like b- being able to play with that, uh, with that sort of meta game is also super fun. For those of you who don't know, Coup, uh, you can see it on the screen right now. Y- y- it's it's last person standing. You can take a number of actions to get coins in order to coup your opponents and take out their lives. Everybody has two lives, two cards face down, and they're only legally allowed to do the actions that are on those cards for those specific characters. However, you can take whatever action you want. And as long as nobody calls you on it, it goes through. Mm-hmm. And so having that that push and pull, because you, you have to put up one of your own lives as like a, a challenge. Because if, if I call you on it and you were telling the truth, I lose a life. And you only have two lives. So it's it's risky to challenge, but it's also risky not to challenge and let the action go through if you think they're lying. So it's just, it's it's such a fun back and forth. I, I honestly, I almost put Skull ahead of Koo because I, I I wanted both of them to be on my list because I, I feel like I will just always travel with these two games. Mm-hmm. But I ended up putting Coup ahead again because of that added depth of complexity. I've played a bunch of Skull now. We were playing it outside the other day on a picnic table, and it was super fun. But I also can see it getting a little bit stale at a certain point, right? Because yeah. it's, it's the same, are you lying or are you not, right? And so there's not much more to the game than just, I'm going to try to read my opponents right now. Although it provides for really memorable and exciting moments of of somebody calling eight flowers and revealing eight flowers amongst the table, which is such a high number. You're like, whoa, how did that happen? Or just flipping the skull on the last last number, right? You go to the people who you know, you're pretty sure that they weren't lying. And then you're left with a person who might have been lying. And then when they were lying, it's a big, like, fun event. Coup just has uh, so much interplay between the five character cards and plays super quickly as well. I just love the depth to this game, and I, I, I won't go anywhere without it. My Coup cards are ratty that I need to put them in sleeves. We were talking a little bit about this in the pre-show yep. about, about sleeve cards. I purposely didn't say Coup in that because <laughs> I wanted to save it for this list. Nice. Um, but Coup, like there's a tear on my assassin card and you can't really have a tear on the cards <laughs> yeah. because then the people will know you're the assassin. So what we do is we just take the player aids and we just put them over top of the cards and it works very well. Nobody Perfect. looks when you deal them out. Nice. You just take them, put them underneath. So you, you'll always find ways to work around these things. Yeah. But yeah, I've played so many games of coup. So, so many, and I'm still not tired of it. Yeah. And the fact that we could play it every lunchtime, like for three months straight, <laughs> I think is a testament to how, how well this game holds up yeah yeah i i agree um it's been a while since i played but i remember there was also a time in my gaming group uh, when i first got in the hobby where it was like played every week you know it's like hey mm-hmm. we start with coup yep. and we play other games and it, it's 100%. still yeah still holds up i now have you played the app I, I, there's an app of this game isn't there um i i think there's an app where you can play <laughs> right if there is i don't know can you play against real people I, you know i'm not sure so maybe i shouldn't have brought if, it up but there is an it, app well, out there. if you if there was an app uh, against an AI, I wouldn't be interested. And honestly, on an app, I wouldn't really be interested either. Mm-hmm. To, to me, what ha- what's so exciting about this game is the interplay, right? I like games that make people talk and yep. make people like laugh and, and do silly things around the table. Yeah. Like my buddy Cody 
for for like two games in a row all he did was take the ambassador action that's <laughs> all he did and we're like nice. you didn't keep an ambassador again he's like yeah i did and then, <laughs> Better challenge me. Or like, I love hey, it. challenge me. Yeah, had the ambassador. And so like, <laughs> you can do like such stupid, funny yeah. things with that to make for like such memorable, great gaming experiences. Yeah. But like, That's I, cool. I wouldn't want that as an app form or, or, or virtual, right? Like, it's just yeah. so much better in person. Agreed. Great choice, Chris. Okay. And again, an easy game to travel with. Uh, let's move on to yeah. number 11. This is uh, my pick. This is another game that. Um, easy to travel with. And I was thinking about theme this time as well. Like, mm. you know, we're traveling, we're getting out to do stuff. And I think this game captures the theme and also it's an ability to travel as far as being a game. It's our number 11, um, our combined list, Trails. Uh, Trails, folks, is uh, the mini version of uh, the game Parks. Um, and cool. this is actually a really affordable game. You can get it at like Target. Uh, I think the retail price is like 20 US. You can get it much cheaper as well. But the components, the artwork are fantastic. Just like Parks, um, you are traveling along national parks, trying to uh, do a little It's um, action selection, a little worker placement, and beautiful components. You just go grab resources, and you're trying to turn those in uh, for badges, which uh, require you to turn in certain resources. You can also take photos and, and whatnot. It's basically the game Parks streamlined down into this very smaller, uh, smaller streamlined version, which plays in about 20 minutes. And if you know me, folks, you know I love those type of games. This is uh, Michelle and I uh, playing on Arch uh, on Tabletop tonight. A little, um, maybe like I don't know, a year or so ago, maybe two years ago. But we love it. Uh, you just you know take your piece, move it on the, to one of the spots there, take the action or the resource collect them and after three rounds going back and forth where has the most points wins it's so streamlined it's a beautiful game and i've actually heard people prefer this some people prefer this over the uh the full game parks i don't agree with that i think this is a way to get parks the feel of parks without having to do as much setup or as much mm. time and of course parks is a lot bigger this one seriously you can fit it again in a box or, or in your pocket or your bag very easily and uh, travel with it, and it does capture that nice feeling of hey, I'm at the I'm at the outdoors, even though I may be indoors playing a game. But it's the great outdoors captured in the box. That's why it's our number eleven, Trails. Nice. I've played Parks. I haven't played Trails, mm -hmm. but uh, honestly, I think Trails might appeal to me more than Parks. Having I didn't I didn't even really know about Trails really. Oh, okay. Because I, I I enjoyed Parks, but. I I've, I never was like a fan, a huge fan of Takedo, and it has that similar like whoever's in last gets to choose the next right. action. I think Parks does it significantly better than Takedo. Agreed. But for me, that that mechanic isn't one that like I really am excited to spend a significant amount of time with. So actually having it in like a twenty minute game, I think that would be around the time where I would be like satisfied playing with it. Yeah, yep. feeling good. Boom, done. Moving on. Right. Yeah. And, and so. So that aspect of it actually really intrigues me, and I think it's it's a really great pick because of it. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up, Chris, because I I distinctly remember one of our friends saying almost the exact same thing. They liked Tokaido, but didn't love it enough to play like a 45 minute game. But then mm -hmm. with Trails, same mechanic, but 20 minutes, it. totally yeah. doable. Yeah, great, great call. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's see what Richard's got for us at number 10, friends. Hmm, very interesting choice, Chris. Cool. Of course that makes sense for you. You're an actor, so you want to spend all your time lying to your friends and seeing how well they lie to you. I have to admit, I tried this once many, many years ago, and I can see the appeal. It's very clever, but oh my god, I hated it so much. Um, but yeah, I totally get it. And I guess if you really wanted to play, I would sit down and lie with you for a half an hour. That didn't come out right. But anyway, um, uh, number Number 11, Trails. Well, I'm going to have to disagree with you there, too. Only because, as sweet and charming as it is, this is a terribly scaled two-player game. Jane and I were so disappointed. I wanted to love it so much. Uh, it's definitely better at higher player counts, which I guess if you're traveling with others makes sense. I don't know. Did, did, was there an expansion for Trails that actually tightened it up and made it a better two-player game? I'm not quite sure. But anyway... 
Whoa, before we continue on, let me just correct the record there. Ruel was talking about Trails. I was talking about Parks, which is basically the prequel to Trails. Or, more to the point, Trails is kind of like Parks Express. And I have not played Trails. And for all I know, it's fantastic as a two-player game. If anybody has played both games at two-player, please let me know down in the comments, because I really want to like Parks. And if Trails is better for two players, I'm all over it. But okay, with that out of the way, let's continue. Uh, let's move on now to number 10 on the list. Tiny Epic Defenders, the second edition. Oh my goodness. Here's the deal. I already talked about one cooperative game that I can just play with anybody. But I also want a cooperative game that I can sit down and play with my wife, Jen. That really challenges us. That pushes us. And Tiny Epic Defenders is one of my all-time faves because it is effectively a super portable, almost micro-game version of Pandemic. It has the same basic idea of traveling around the world and fighting hotspots, and most importantly, anticipating where those hotspots are going to be and staying one step ahead. This is a cooperative game where players get to be proactive instead of reactive. And it borrows the very, very cool... Um, <clears throat> Uh, card uh, deck uh, a variable turn system of Aeon's Inn. In fact, did this game come out before Aeon's Inn? Did Aeon's Inn borrow it from Tiny Epic Defenders? I don't know. But regardless, the second edition of this game is so gorgeous. Introduced so many really cool, amazing ideas with uh, fancy, fanciful bosses like a uh, Shadow of Colossus Giant you ride around on the back of, all kinds of things. Lots of variety with the different special player powers. And it's just a ton of very challenging if you play at the higher difficulty level cooperative fantasy adventure gameplay in just about the tiniest package you can get. It is epic and yet it is tiny and if I were allowed if I could also throw in Tiny Epic Defenders The Dark War which is still an incredibly tiny box. It's two tiny epic boxes. Oh my gosh. It, it goes even further for replayability and so many cool um, wonderful evocative and very very challenging cooperative uh, gameplay choices. Uh, again, you know, I mean, I'd love to bring Pandemic, but Pandemic is a bigger game with a bigger board. This is one uh, you can uh, pretty much set up and play anywhere and have a fantastic time. Number 10 on the list, Tiny Epic Defenders, the second edition. Wow, I I thought he would have put Pandemic on here, but not the regular Pandemic, but the the smaller version of Pandemic, mm, right? Yeah. So, yeah. surprise, surprise. Um, I was surprised. I, I didn't, uh, I mean, I... Okay, well, here's my take on. It. I played Tiny Epic Defenders the first edition. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't like it. I I, I don't yeah. remember why I didn't like it. It just it really fell flat with me. And I have heard that the second edition fixed a lot of things that were wrong with the first edition. So maybe you know, I I want to uh, I want to give it another shot. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fair, right? The, there can be those sort of really significant differences between editions that that change things and and make them work. I. I expected some sort of tiny epic something to be on this list, right? Yeah. Their their whole line is based around like big games in a small package, right? Uh, and so it's it's cool that this that Defenders also fits that bill. I've only played Tiny Epic Quest out of all the Tiny Epic series. Oh, I've okay. Played, yeah. Um, I've heard that Galaxies is like the tippity top, though generally. Yeah. So that, that that would have been my bet for for seeing a, a tiny epic on this list. But yeah. uh, Defenders, there you go. Yeah. A co op, right? That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, speaking of Tiny Epic Quest, how'd you like that one? I mean, if that's your only tiny epic. Um, you know, yeah, game you I thought it was good. I, I it ultimately left my collection because I found that it, it it's weird with these sorts of games that I think it does so much. But it also needed such a large table presence as well, right? Yeah. So because you're laying out all the cards in Quest and you're making this big row, yeah. I was like, well, this kind of is is defeating the purpose a little bit yeah. in terms of if I'm if I'm going to be playing this big sp sprawling thing, I'll probably play like a larger game. Yeah. It, it defeats the purpose of me of me kind of carrying it around. Yep. Um. So yeah, it, th that was that was all right. I like the Zelda theme. I mean, like it was clearly Zelda. Let's be real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I I like that, but I, it just it just didn't like it didn't grab me as much as I was hoping it to. And then it was in that really weird in between place that I was like, you know what? I never grabbed this because I'm gra if I'm grabbing small games, 
I'm getting a smaller game, right? Like I want a smaller experience. And if I'm yeah. grabbing larger games, well, then I'm going to get a larger experience. So it's yeah. just in that weird middle ground for me. That's totally um, fair. Yeah, that, yeah, that's totally fair. Um, let's move on, Chris. What you got for us? And uh, I think we're on number nine now. Yeah, I'm really excited about this next one because I just played it oh. for, for the first time like a month ago. And it, it's been around for ages. Mm -hmm. I've I've known it's good. People have said it's good. And now I can agree that it's good. Uh, this was brought in by a, a, a castmate in the in the show. We were talking oh. about board games, and she said, "Oh well, I have Hero Realms. We should play that." And nice. then she brought in Hero Realms, and I just, I, I, I love it. I think there's this is such a great deck builder in a small package that also has a small footprint too. Mm -hmm. um, you're you're going to be you have like eighty cards or something. It's it's a very small box. It's about the same size as like a tiny epic box, really. And you have a number of cards. They're basically broken down into four different categories. And those four different categories or classes synergize with each other. And you just want to get the cards that let you punch your opponent in the face better than they can punch you in the face. That's it. Mm. Uh, and it, it, But the way what really intrigued me and what drew me in is the way the synergies worked. I found that like... Each of the different color synergies was interesting. Uh, I found that I wanted to play it again. We didn't really get through a lot of the deck, too. That's also what I'm generally worried about in these sort of smaller card games is the amount of cards that you go through and therefore that impacting the replayability. And I know there's a ton of expansions for Hero Realms. So I was like, yes. okay, maybe that's why there's a ton of expansions for Hero Realms because the, like, the replayability isn't there. But I don't think that's the case. I just think people like the system and wanted more. Uh, yeah, I, I was really charmed by this. You you buy cards, you play them in front of you, and they're usually either like attacking cards or they're like little heroes that you can put out and they stay outside of your deck as well yeah. until the opponent kills them. And they can constantly be used every round. And so some of them, your opponent has to target before they can target you, which then provides a huge barrier. And also I can feel like there might be a little bit of a runaway leader issue with yeah. Hero Realms. I haven't played it enough to know. But it, it kind of feels like it, it could lean that way if you just get a big, a big fearsome big bad out there that your opponent just can't break through. Then yeah. you get a couple rounds of being able to hit your opponent when they can't hit you, and it feels like that that'll be like the nail in the coffin. But for me, like I I don't mind that because I like the synergies that you can create, and I'm just really really charmed by this game, and will definitely be adding a, a it or star realms to my collection because they're essentially the same yeah um yeah pretty much at some point if i see it for a good price and there there's always a good price too i think hero realms or star realms showed up in one of my like march madness deathmatch tournaments where we were about best value games under 25 bucks and yeah. i think hero realms like they was sitting around there so the fact that you can have such a good game for that yeah, it's really good. Yeah, I agree. I love Hero Realms, and I also love Star Realms. This system of games mm. is so excellent. As you can see, you're talking about expansions. Richard, in the video that we're watching right now, that's actually the Ruins of, Thun of Thundar, um, Ooh, cool. the campaign game. So it actually takes Ooh. that system, and you have a story. Oh, it's so good. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed this one. I, it's a great call, Chris. I... I think it's a better game. Uh, I just think it's a better game than Star Realms. But I'm such a sci-fi mm -hmm. geek. I I have a you know I I still have my original Star Realms and <laughs> toss in my bag. You know I actually got that one for honestly on sale for like seven dollars US one time. So you can find these wow, ultra cheap nice. folks. Yeah, yeah, and, for sure, right? Yeah. yeah, and Hill Realms. Oh, it's such a good one. I, it's I'm glad this was made on the list. Um, mm -hmm. I think I well well. Folks, if you was watch that potential the, for yours, yeah, uh, folks, if you watch the extended yeah. edition of this, if you watch it live, we actually talk about the games that didn't make the list. So I may or may not have included the Star Wars. <laughs> you have to watch the extended edition for that. But great call with uh, Hero sounds, Realms. It sounds like you may have it. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, great call. Uh, let's move on to our number eight. And once again, Chris, I was thinking two things: games that you could travel with, but also the theme of traveling and. You know, like a lot of us uh, here in the U.S., we like to take road trips during the summer. I'm sure everyone likes to do it. But taking a road trip, it's a time-honored tradition during the summer. So I had to include this one. This is our number eight. And it is, let me get the uh, video ready to roll. Uh, it is the number eight a combined list, Rolling America. And this mm. is a rolling right that, again, it's available at Target, your big box stores, for under $10 U.S. I, I think it might be like $12 retail. Our friends Monique and Naveen playing it here. Um, roll standard dice, but they're all different colors. And you're trying to fill in the states of the U.S. And 
what you're trying to do is connect numbers that are sim uh, that are alike. So you can have like the sixes together. I think it's, yeah, you can have numbers together or sequences or, or, or whatnot. But then you're going to eventually get to that point where you cannot fill in a square or a state based on the number that's rolled. But that's when the special abilities come in. You can duplicate numbers. You can, add, I think, add or subtract one from them. It's been a while since I played, but I remember how much I love this. Um, it actually traveled with me for a while in my bag. It would be one, the one I would take and just, you know, play, you know, uh, either on a plane when I'm traveling or whatever, because you can play solo. It's only eight rounds, 20 minute game, wonderful roll and write. And I had to have some kind of roll and write on this list. And if you would have asked me, like what my favorite roll and write is all time, I'd lean towards like cartographers or um, dinosaur island roll and write, or even mm -hmm. on tour, which is sort of got a travel theme. But as far as, you know, taking it and putting it in a bag, this is the one that fits the best in a bag. It's another one that's really tiny, and it can fit uh, in your uh, hip pocket or whatever. And that's why I chose it for our number eight, Rolling America. And this one is actually based on um, an older game, I believe, called Rolling Japan, which had, uh, hmm. you know, Japan, you know, sectioned out into little uh, areas. But then they adapted to American audience and did Rolling America. But... Um, I don't think there's a role in Canada, Chris. I'm sorry, but uh, we do have role in America. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we're we're kind of in tickets ride. There's like there's like two or three places. So, yeah, you know that's that's where we get ours. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. So, role in America. Have you uh, played this one, Chris? No, I've played on tour. I was going to ask you uh, it, how you felt between the two, but you you seem to prefer on tour more as like a game, but you prefer to travel with this one. Yeah, that's the sense that I got. Oh, absolutely. I think on, on tour is an awesome game, but it, it yeah. is bigger and, you know, I can't really see. I mean, you could travel with it, but this one, it, it's like this big. So it's definitely oh, a pocket, yeah. pocket size game. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's see what Richard's got for us. What are we at? Number seven. All right, Hero Realms, Chris, I don't disagree. That's a great choice. I think most people would probably throw Star Realms in their backpack, but nope, I think Hero Realms is definitely the superior game of the two, especially if you throw in, I forget the name of it, the, the Rundar or the Thundar. Or, there's an expansion that turns it into an excellent little cooperative campaign fantasy adventure game. That is Chef's Kiss awesomeness. So, cool. And uh, what, what was yours? Oh, Rolling America. I've not played that, but I did play the original Rolling Japan. And it's an excellent little roll and write. Uh, wonderful choices. Okay, then let's move on to number seven, Furnace. Although, what I'm showing here is Furnace with the new expansion, Interbellum. Now, I take Furnace anyway, but the Interbellum expansion fits in the box too. And oh my gosh, here's the deal. I want to have at least one game in my bag that is crunchy, super crunchy, like incredibly heavy uh, and a dense challenging Euro um, in a super tiny package, and it doesn't get much crunchier than Furnace, a wonderful, fast-playing, and brilliantly elegant little auction game uh, that also, by the way, with the Interbellum expansion, plays fantastically solo as well, in case Jen's off doing something and I'm stuck by myself for a while. I have a great time with it solo, but when you add the Interbellum expansion, uh, this is one of the crunchiest games Jen and I have played this year. So deep, um, you know, so many options. Uh, the uh, it adds so many cool new features. But I would bring Furnace even without Interbellum because of the core idea of an auction game, where half the time when you place your bid, you place it wanting to lose. Because whenever you lose on whatever you're bidding on, you get a consolation prize. And the higher you bid, the bigger that consolation prize is. So you want a big consolation prize. But if you bid too high, you might end up winning the card in the first place that you didn't even want. Because it doesn't work with the rest of the engine you're building for yourself. So freaking brilliant, this game. And Interbellum takes it to the next level. So number seven on the list has to be, for me, Furnace. Wow, I didn't even consider this a travel game i you know the box isn't that small but you know now that i think about it you could totally take the stuff out of the box and make it a smaller size game mm -hmm. right uh, but a brilliant game one of my favorites of the last few years uh furnace is outstanding yeah i really want to try it it's on my list i yeah. haven't played it yet but it's like i've heard such good things yeah. and the box is thin enough too like it's it's thin enough and it's like about yay size yeah it's slightly bigger um, a little bit bigger than my number one, but... Oh, uh, okay. 
I guess we'll have to wait and see what that is. You have to wait. Okay. Well, we're at number six, Chris, which is your choice again. What you got for us? Uh, yeah, number six. Well, we'll see if Richard agrees with me again. I oh, know sorry. he is just really excited to lie with me. That's that's <laughs> all. That's all I got from from his, and that's why he's agreeing with your realms. He's trying to butter me up. Uh, but uh, so we'll see how he feels about this one. It feels so. It, it's so odd to me for us to to agree on something, right? <laughs> but uh, but now, but th- this one, this one was was the first thing that I put on this list i think i was like okay i'm thinking about travel games you you got to think about this abstract game and that's hive pocket nice it's the travel version of hive which nobody ever needs to get hive ever again because this exists and is cheaper for the exact same game right you're it's an abstract game you're putting a tile out into the middle you have to surround the opponent's queen with tiles. They can be their own tiles or your tiles. doesn't matter. And then every tile you put out moves in a different way. So ants scutter around the side. Grasshoppers jump in a straight line. Um, you get the picture. They all have different abilities. Yep. And it's, it's very chess-like is how it's often described. And I agree with that because it's this tactical back and forth of positioning and maneuvering and, and trying to get your pieces in the locking position uh, instead of the other the the other position, right? The non-locking position, the position where they're basically garbage. Um, (laughs) And and what's cool about this is that you can't break the chain, right? So that's how you can lock things into place. You put your your piece in a spot where if they were to move the piece that they want to move, it then breaks the chain so they can no longer. And that's kind of the back and forth. Uh, This is a game that I I don't yet own. I've been meaning to pick up a copy. It's just because my friend has a copy. And if I'm going to play Hive with somebody, I'm probably going to play Hive with with my friend. Um, My girlfriend doesn't really like these sort of abstract, Mm. tactical, head-to-head style games. So, like, I wouldn't play with her. But the fact that all it is are just these pieces, this, again, hits the criteria of being perfect to play outside as well. This is a game you can put in in your pocket and really go and play literally anywhere. I think in the uh, one review, maybe Shut Up and Sit Down, their review of Hive was like out in a desert. And they just placed it on some rocks. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it, it's just all it is are the pieces, and the pieces are really good quality. Yeah. I think it's a really smart, interesting game. So it was a no brainer to be on the list. And that's why it's this high up there as well, because it kind of feels like the obvious pick. But uh, I still have one more that I'm more excited about to talk about. And nice. so that's why uh, it, it is where it is. Yeah, great call. I Yeah, I love Hive. And as you said, it, it does have that parallel to chess, right? Abstract. But, mm-hmm. you know, this plays in like, a, it's a lot simpler. Um, but there's still a ton of strategy in it. And I don't, I don't have this either. I feel like I need this uh, game in my collection. I've always enjoyed yeah. it. I just don't know why I don't have it. Um, and I know... It's- it's one but, of those things where, like, if you don't, <clears throat> I feel like if you play a lot of that abstract like stuff, you you you're you're gonna get into it. But like, yeah. it, it it it's one where like I I want to have it, but I also know it needs a particular player to like enjoy with. True, I think that's it. Yeah. It's not as pan applicable to like a lot of other people. So you really need to have that player who will enjoy it to the same extent that you do. And I think that's why I don't own a copy because the player who enjoys it to the same extent as I do already has a copy and like not a lot of other players will enjoy it to that same extent. Right. Or, yeah. And so therefore it, it doesn't really make sense to add. That's yep. probably why, why I have delayed, but it's one where I like, if I see it on sale, I'm probably just going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. And you know, I didn't, um, I've seen the regular hive more often than I've only seen the hive pocket edition once before. Mm. And it, it's oh, really? yeah, totally, totally travel, uh, travel and, I think it's even, so much better. Yeah, yeah. I think even the the original yeah. one, you can still travel with it, but the pocket. You one, could, yeah. The pieces are just bigger. They're not, yeah, yeah. They're not too too big, but yeah. Yeah. Great call, yeah. Chris. Well done. Okay, let's move on to number five. This is uh, my choice for the list, and you know we were just talking about Hero Realms, a Star Realms. This is the one for me personally that actually replaced Star Realms and Hero Realms mm. for me. I love this game, and I did a run through of it here on the Ronald Runs Through channel. It is Star Wars, the deck building game. Now, of course, I had to think nice. of our theme, Chris, as far as, 
you know, um, traveling. This one, you get to travel to a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> you all saw that coming. Um, and what you're doing, you have two sides. You have the rebels, uh, you know, the rebel scum, and you also have the empire. And you're dueling. It's a back and forth game. Um, but what this does is it has the different factions that you can play. You can take them into your deck, or if it's a rival faction, your your opponent, you can actually blow them up out of the uh, row that you're um, buying from. So if I see Darth Vader there, and I'm the Rebels, and if I generate enough combat, boom, Vader's out of there. My opponent can no longer get him. I, of course, it's going to take a ton, and it never happens, but um, it, you can theoretically, theoretically uh, make that happen. But here's the cool thing, Chris. As you play, you're building up your deck, and then you start to see those combos happen, just like Hero Realms, just like Star Realms, but super thematic. Mm -hmm. You've got the ships that'll, you know, protect you. Uh, then, I mean, my favorite combos are the ones with the characters. So if you just happen to have Han Solo and Chewbacca working together, and then you get the Millennium Falcon in your deck, oh my gosh, yeah, game over. You're just going to destroy uh, the right. Empire. And vice versa, you know, if you have Darth Vader, you know, in his ship, and oh, and you've got the uh, the big Death Stars and whatnot. Oh, it's so thematic, and just like Star Wars and Hero Realms, it's quick. Now it's not it's not quite as fast, but you still have that really cool feeling of hey, I'm ramping up my deck super fast here, and then I can start doing the cool stuff. It's not it's not a slow burn like Dominion. No, you get to the action part right away. And you know, being a Star Wars geek, it's all I ever wanted in a deck builder. You know, having all the different characters and whatnot. And now this, I should say this: this is only I think it's the original trilogy with i think rogue one so of course they built in the thing of hey there's right. there's probably gonna be expansions and you know oh, i'm gonna sure. be getting all of them you know because <laughs> i love star wars but the system works well and the one thing i do want to point out that's really unique to this uh deck builder you have the force now the force is uh, something that's going to help you generate uh additional actions on your cards but the force is uh, it's, it's a tug of war so whenever you play a card that has the force on it you're going to bring the force towards your side vice versa the opponent can bring the force to their side if you get it all the way to your side you're going to get additional resources but whenever it's on your side if a trigger says if you have the force get this this and that and i love that the cards have this ability to you know get more powerful depending on if you have the force on your side or not i think it's a really clever design um if you've played star realms or hero realms you'll see a lot of similarities but there's really some cool unique things uh to the game as well and that's why it's our number five Star Wars, the deck building game. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds cool. That, yeah. that does sound cool. Very, seems very Hero Realms how you describe it. I thought it was going to be, uh, I, I thought it was more of a, like a standard deck builder, but that I didn't realize it was that head to head. For, yeah. for um, the Rebels and the Imperials, then you, you have separate markets for each? No, you have one combined no. market. So you're oh, sort cool. of, yeah, you're battling over that. And oh, then the cool thing is too, there's also the, the factionless um, uh, uh, characters and ships, sort of like the, the bounty hunters. So you can mm. directly hire, you know, sort of some of these bounty hunters. Now I think Boba Fett is always going to go towards the Empire, but there are other, um, you'll recognize some of the other bounty hunters where, okay, I can bring them to the Rebels and, and vice cool. versa and stuff. So it's really neat. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I love it. But let's see what Rich has got for number four coming right up. Okay, uh, Chris, Hive Pocket, I cannot disagree because, once again, you're agreeing with Eleni, and if she says it's good, then I'll go with it. Although, yeah, I've played Hive, I get it. My only complaint about that is that it's only a two-player game, and you're kind of limiting your options to play with other people, right? Can you play Hive multiple players? Nope, it's just black and white, but still very, very clever. And uh, speaking of Elaney, uh, her channel, Cardboard Rhino, uh, a few years ago, she actually played it underwater, which I thought was a very, very cool thing. We talked about it many, many years ago when I did this list originally. And oh, real, what did you have? Oh, Star Wars Deck Builder, right. So more not Star Realms, although I... I don't mean to downplay. I mean, I think if I were to, I would certainly play this over Star Realms. Boy, Star Realms is getting no love today, right? Uh, every way we can avoid playing Star Realms while still playing Star Realms, we're investigating ways to do it. And once again, so both of you just want to play with one other person while you're traveling. Well, okay, that's fine. Uh, that's not the case for me because number four on the list certainly works with higher player count. It is Tiny Towns, which by the way, if you can get it, bring the Villagers expansion as well because because it adds so much to this already wonderful little game. It's interesting, when I started thinking about making this list, I decided, you know, I, I love polyomino tile layers, and I really wanted to put one on the list. 
And the more and more I was just trying to narrow it down, I just kept coming back to this because this is a polyomino game where you build your polyominoes, where every round, uh, bingo style, <clears throat> or p- via player choice, depending on which mode you want to play in, uh, players are putting cubes out. You're trying to get the right colors next to each other to create uh, building spaces in this incredibly tight, compact little board. And this game is so much fun. One of my absolute all-time favorites. Uh, an incredibly tiny package. Don't bring the box. Just bring the player boards and the deck of cards and a bag full of all the cubes and you've got an incredibly um, portable and incredibly fun game that you can play at you know any number of player counts. And man, I love this to pieces so much. And I mentioned the villagers, which is what I'm showing right here. Uh, this just brings a few more pieces where you've got these cool little um, villager meeples, animal meeples as well, um, that give you special powers if you can build where the villagers are. Elevates the game even more. But again, even though I keep talking about these expansions, I would bring Tiny Towns just uh, in the in the straight box. It's so great. Again, one of my all-time faves and uh, yeah, just perfect for life on the road. Number four, Tiny Towns. I see has it there. I was just going to say, that's a pretty big box to travel. It's a pretty big box. It's like a standard ticket to ride size box. I mean, to, to Richard's credit, he did say, don't bring the box. Yep. Um, I I brought uh, Tiny Towns with me as well. Uh, I, have a, I, have a, I have a video where I, where I just went through what I was packing and I agonized over it. But the best part about t- Tiny Towns for me, I put all the little um, towns in their own separate little bins right yes. here. Because Perfect. I just think it's it's better than opening the bags and dumping them out for everything. Anytime you have a common supply for something, for my for my mind, you put it in a bin because then you're going to take things out slowly. Done. If you have player pieces where like everybody's going to have their own player pieces and you're likely going to use them all, then you put those in bags yep. because then they can uh, be passed out. But what I what I figured out is that uh, I could I'm going to hold it up here. Oh. I can fit an entire box of letter jam in here wow. and a little package of Dutch Blitz in here yes. uh, in order to get more into my bag. And uh, yeah, so so that shows even with all of this like hardware and like organization, I'm still able to fit in a couple extra games into that tiny towns box. Brilliant. And so um, that's that's this is it plays really well at six and it's nice to it's nice to have uh it's nice to have a game that like is quick that plays with a lot of people. Yeah. As we know, Richard is famous for loving games that play at a higher player count and not with two players, as he right. has specified. Um, we we know this to be true <laughs> because he doesn't like our two player picks. And so um and we know that that he will never complain about anything not having a two player mode from here on out because of his love for large scale games <laughs> exactly <laughs> i love what you did with your game i mean you impact all those games and also i love the fact that you worked dutch blitz into yet another episode of the R&R show it's it made it uh, well if, done, hey friend. if richard if richard didn't say it i'll put it back it was behind me it, it was behind me i just pulled it off the uh, <laughs> off the shelf behind me nice yeah if richard hadn't brought it up it wouldn't have been coming out but i wanted to show my little storage solution well not storage solution just just the amount of stuff that you could pack in yeah. right when traveling that's which great. is always good to consider fantastic Um, love it um yeah so i love tiny towns and folks you can also solo it if you're a solo board gamer it has a mm. really easy to uh, implement solo mode uh using uh, basically a deck of cards uh but yeah tiny towns a winner um but let's move on Uh, we're getting close to the uh, number one game uh what you got for us chris well my last contribution to this list is a game that i didn't bring with me and I'm I'm agonized actually that I haven't brought it with me, and it kind of solidified that it should be the number one, and that I should just auto bring it no matter what, mm-hmm. because it's so good. I've talked about this game a few times on this channel. It's it's in a very compact box, uh, around almost the same size as Letter Jam the box, it, oh. but you get it, it, it's it's a it's a game where there is so much game packed into this box. It is so so good. Oh. This is the Red Cathedral. Nice. And you know what? Yeah. Right before, um, you know, I just got a, a message from our friend Andrew. He told me to show this on screen. Uh, what is this all about, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's That seems like uh, that's a little sweet little grasshopper uh, who's jumping around. It seems like it's Gisbert Grasshopper. Not quite sure. I, I don't know if that's the... I think it might be the mascot on the Red Cathedral box. I'm fairly certain. Gotcha. Uh, handsome, though. 
I'm yeah, sure very that handsome grasshopper. grasshopper will grow up to love board games even more than that grasshopper loves uh, right uh, now. I can't I'm believe he, he asked me to show that. I, I, the... <laughs> so... He's been he's been threatening me. That yeah, he's going to be out of one of these days. <laughs> but anyways. Back to the Red Cathedral. Yes, yeah. uh, fantastic game. Oh, it's so good. It, yeah. It's so so good. You can see you just have that small player board and your your single player boards. It 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 plays fairly compactly too. Like you can't play it on an airplane tray table, which ideally that's like a video that I want to think about making or whatever. Like in terms of travel, I'm trying to think about those like space constraints, mm-hmm. but I don't care because it is just such a good solid game you can do three things on your turn you either claim a section of the cathedral which is over on the right side of the screen you can um move a dice the number of pips on the dice and take resources wherever it lands if it lands on a space with more dice you get more of that resource or you can put those resources up on the space in the cathedral that you've claimed that's it now you know how to play the game uh it it also comes in like it's such a small box that you can't fit the expansion in. It, it had an expansion come out recently, also a really solid expansion, but I love the base just as it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wish there was a way to fit both into the box because then I would play with the expansion all the time, but there isn't. Uh, but I, I just think for for size of box versus quality of game, it doesn't get any better than the Red Cathedral. It's... It's so fun. I'm so happy that I've I've gotten to play it and that I have it in my collection. And I I just th- this is also one game where I took I, the reason why I didn't bring it on this contract that I'm on is because I brought it to the last contract that I was on and I oh. decided to try out different different games with different people. But the last contract I played with people who like barely played board games at, at all, and they instantly were like, "Yeah, I want to go out and buy this game." Oh, I played cool. it with my parents and they understood it immediately and had like a blast. They're nice. they're a great litmus test for me it it, it's surprising that it can be a game of such like depth and tight decisions and yet also is really really accessible uh it's it's just fantastic they're having a a competition at the in the outer ring of the world series board gaming where you could win a trip to essen through it the viewers sponsor that whole thing and like it's one where like i wish i could play in that it's just so good i can't talk about this game enough and we're running out of time but but like if you haven't played this game check out reviews check it out it's such a great 80 minute game and to top it off it says 80 minutes on the box and it's usually consistently 80 minutes like there's none of the 60 to 90 minutes they're like we know our game's 80 minutes we know exactly how it plays it's just like a a a home run really Uh, it's it should be with me I'm devastated that past Chris was like, no, try different things on different people. No, past Chris, you idiot. Do you want to try the same things? And and I and I legitimately am disappointed that I didn't bring it because it also is so small that I have zero reason to not have brought it with me. Yeah. It's but, uh, yeah, you are absolutely right. Red Cathedral, fantastic. And you know, I love that they have placed this really, you know deep strategic game in a small box like they could have easily Mm -hmm. put this in like a ticket to ride science box right 100 percent. they could you know yeah but they decide not to and i love that and something about devere doing they've done that with other games too like bamboo just came out again another game that's around the same size box but they could have easily expanded i want to see more publishers do this chris i want to see us bringing this uh, these down you know quit wasting space yeah Um, yeah absolutely like you have to do it for the shelf space for like marketing you'd get Mm -hmm. you get more visibility on the shelf right that's why you see so many games do it yeah but like i think we we should we should praise the publishers that don't and that just give you such a compact wonderful experience and in in, like a well thought out awesome tiny box agreed and space yeah yeah and as we're talking about this i just realized it says number four in red cathedral no that was our number three folks Mm, that was Uh, our number three yeah see what happens when i try you know i agree to do a prank on chris i just (laughs) yeah so andrew i'm looking at you um let's move well no okay number four was red cathedral number three was gisbert grasshopper there you go thank you yes thank you chris (laughs) let's move our number two and now that the silliness is set aside Number two, I'm going to continue with, hey, this game is all about traveling. It's also a great travel game. And I'm going to bring us back around to, we already talked about it, folks. It's 
Number two, Tiny Epic Galaxies. Uh, this is... Oh, nice. Yeah. You know, you were talking about it, Chris. I had... It, this was definitely going <laughs> on my list. Uh, just like Dutch Blitz, this is a game that I've talked about several times uh, on the mm. channel. Uh, I mean, I just think it's brilliant. Um, it is, in my opinion, the best Tiny Epic game out there. Um, it's a dice uh, placement... Or not dice placement. It's a dice chucking game. But you're using it to, you know, gather your resources and trying to convert those to get the planets into your galaxy. Um, the big part of this game, which I think is absolutely brilliant, I love it, is the follow mechanism. So anytime it's someone else's turn, if you have the right resource, in this case, culture, it's either culture or um, economic, I mm. think, um, or energy. Uh, if you have culture, you can spend a culture to follow someone's action and get the same you know, benefits. And I love that because you're always engaged. It's not like... It's not like, hey, I roll dice and someone just watches me. No, you roll dice and people are going to say, hey, I want to follow that move or I, I don't want to follow that yet. And it's a lot of back and forth. It's a great solo game as well. And um, it's now, you know, I, we were talking about Tiny Epic Quest earlier and I brought this up for a reason. Tiny Epic Quest is a huge footprint for a Tiny Epic game. Mm -hmm. This one is not. As you can see, you just got a couple of cards here. Yeah. Um, I have my dice tray, but, you know, you don't need a dice tray. And it just has, you know, the small cards and the little, um, you know, player mats as well. Now, I do have custom player mats um, that uh, a friend of mine 3D printed for me, but the game is uh, outstanding. It plays in about 20 to 30 minutes. It's a race to, I think, 20 victory points. And then you, uh, you can have secret missions as well that you score and get extra points. But boy, it is fantastic. Now... There is an expansion for this game, and this is where I was thinking about tidying up a quest. When you have the expansion, it's a great expansion, but boy, it mm. totally takes up the entire table. So, as much as like I like the expansion, if I'm going to travel with a game, uh, it's going to be the base game uh, for Tiny Epic Galaxies, and that's why it's my number two on the list: Tiny Epic Galaxies. Nice, good pick. You you've really fooled me. I didn't see this coming. You didn't see I it. Thought, no, you you did a very good job. Of being nice. Like, mm, yeah, oh well, yeah, Tiny Epic Galaxies. <laughs> I suppose, yeah. Some people do like that, don't they? Hmm. <laughs> I can do a little acting too, Chris. So <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got the role. You got Thank the part. <laughs> Let's see what's on top of our list. Uh, take it away, Richard. Excellent choice, Chris. Red Cathedral is fantastic and continues Devere's streak of of cramming big, big game experiences into tiny, tiny boxes. I absolutely love it. Although, I will um, put a proviso. I don't think I'd want to travel with Red Cathedral without the Contractors expansion. Or not the whole expansion. I don't need all the extra board and whatnot. But just those extra guilds. That's the only thing Red Cathedral needed was a little bit more variety with the guild powers every time you play. So it's just a few more cards to throw in the box and yes i would happily play with you chris if we were traveling together an excellent choice and well tiny epic galaxies you better believe it we're tiny epic brothers i guess uh we can uh, play some cooperative defenders from earlier on my list and then uh go at it toe to toe i guess um uh, yeah, for me, Tiny Epic Galaxies is the second best of the Tiny Epic series. I prefer Defenders because I'd rather work with you than against you. And Tiny Epic Galaxies can have some player screwage, but it's not too bad. And it's absolutely brilliant. But um, both of those games are eclipsed, as far as I'm concerned, by number one on the list, Jump Drive. Which is basically Race for the Galaxy, the Express game. Although, honestly, Race for the Galaxy makes for a great travel game, too. But there is so much packed into this game that just plays over five or six rounds. It's a quick 15-minute filler, uh, and yet it is so satisfying doing all this, uh, the stuff you would expect from Race for the Galaxy. Building up your intergalactic civilization, uh, depending on the cards you play, taking it in radically different directions. And um, again, imagine a full game of Race for the Galaxy with all that really wonderful, satisfying leveling up and all that to get it done in 15 or 20 minutes um, and then play again and play again. We, we have never played this game and Jen hasn't said, set it up, we're going again right now. It is so fun and so um, compelling and so much variety. It just plays out uniquely every time. And... What the heck? Let's uh, once again talk about an expansion. The brand new Terminal Velocity expansion that just came out, uh, that Jen and I just played for the first time the other day, oh my gosh, elevates this game. It took it out of my top um, like 150 games and put it in my top 
50, I think. Um, the Terminal Velocity expansion, which I think is available now, adds uh, unique player powers because you get a starting planet, adds public goals, allows it to go up to five-player game now, which makes it even better for travel games if you're in with a group of... I guess this is going to be more of a gamer geek game because, again, there is so much uh, going on, even in such a short time frame, that you've got to make tough decisions I love it to pieces. One of my all-time faves. A lot of game in a tiny, tiny box. It's basically just a deck of cards and some tokens to treat track of score. It is number one on the list. Jump Drive. And folks, check out the Terminal Velocity expansion when you get a chance. It's amazing. Great <laughs> choice for number one. Now, I don't have Jump Drive, but I actually have The City. And The City was the, the original one. And then Tom Lehman, the designer, redid it for Jump Drive, which is a re-implementation of Race for the Galaxy. Cool. Um, I, I have the city because Michelle prefers that theme of building the city, and um, it's the same thing. It's super quick. Uh, you are you know discarding cards to uh, build certain things. Plays in 15, 20 minutes. I absolutely love this game in both versions, Jump Drive and the city. Um, have you been able to play nice. this one, Chris? No, but I, I'm a big fan of Race for the Galaxy, I, and yeah. Race for the Galaxy would be a really good uh, good contender. I think. Yeah. I think that was a, a smart smart call. Oh, and, and just a quick note on Red Cathedral. Yeah, with the expansion, you do get a bunch of other guild cards that you can just really easily implement. That's the one that I, I do have it in my Red Cathedral box. Nice. And then I have all the other contractor stuff on the outside, too. It's just nice. If you have those variable variable cards that yeah. like let you do things, super easy to implement. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, Race for the Galaxy, great. Jump Drive, sounds cool. Those are travel games. That's That's all. Yeah. Great, great, great list. Uh, again, thank you, Chris, for uh, joining us today. And uh, thanks to Richard for joining us via the power of a video. And I um, mm -hmm. want to thank Upper Story, these publishers of Spintronics, for sponsoring this episode of the r and &R, r Show. Be sure to click the show notes below for more information. And until next time, we'll see you later.